uh, this time will be in the Hamilton Library and uh, we would be in person uh, having our annual general meeting, meeting with members, uh, meeting with board members and talking about all the great work that we're doing in the community. However, uh, we are in a global pandemic and now we, are, uh, we have to do things online. So uh, this is why we're doing uh, our, our AGM online. Uh, folks on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter will be able to watch this. Uh, good evening. I hope you're well. Uh, we have a couple of board members that are also joining us so that you know who uh, who the board members are. So uh, I, I will do a quick introduction of uh, who is here with, with, with us. We have Tina Garrett Garnett, who's with us, Michelle Poirier, Crystal Mark, uh, Councillor Maureen Wilson, and Amy Majani. So uh, we're going to start off with uh, a message from the chair of uh, the board, who is uh, Crystal Mark. We can't hear you, Crystal. Hello, everyone. Welcome, Ani Chimigwech. My name is Crystal Mark, and I'm the chair of the board of Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion. Um, for the past year, I've been honored to contribute to an organization that centers equity, diversity, and inclusion at the heart of its work. In my professional life, I'm a writer and equity educator at one of the province's most diverse universities. And in my personal life, I'm a new Hamiltonian parent who is invested in the community I live in and ensuring that Hamilton is a safe space for all. This year as chair has brought many positive observations, even in the midst of our pandemic. Our interim executive director wants our program manager has been promoted to the role of full-time executive director. Uh, Kojo has led the charge for mobilization on issues that affect Hamilton's social, culture, culture, and civic consciousness. We have made amazing strides as a, and, um, and as a steward of the organization, both humbled and proud to be working with such a multifaceted, talented, diverse team of staff, volunteers, and board members who are committed to the vision where all hands are valued, accepted, and engaged in civic leadership that impacts their lives and those generations moving forward. Youth engagement, um, organizational mentorship, care mongering through the pandemic, founding the first provincial wide disability justice network and mobilizing the resources through caring Canadians to support financially what they stand for politically has given us a, a whirlwind year. The impacts of the global pandemic have been challenging. Isolation, illness, social distancing have all had an impact on how we live and participate in community. Yet despite these challenges, HCCI has managed to thrive under a global crisis and establish itself as an organization the public can put its support and trust in and that funders can rely on to deliver programs and engage our civic duty, provide education, resources, and mentorship to support our youth. And it's these things that allow me to say with confidence that we had a fabulous year. Our donors our memberships and our fundraising has been cool to our ability to do more in Hamilton. Please consider donating to our cause. Each investment draws us closer to a Hamilton community where restorative justice, civic engagement, and equitable inclusion are the hallmarks of our reputation. I'd like to make a special acknowledgement for the grassroots work happening down at City Hall with the Disability Justice Network and community mobilizing for diverting funds from the police to establish safe and equitable housing strategies in Hamilton. For this, we give thanks to our many partnerships and solidarity for sovereignty and land back with Indigenous people in Hamilton, our continued mobilization to eradicate anti-Black racism, our support of the Two-Spirit LGBT community, 
and our commitment to a greater sense of accessibility for all bodies that live and work in Hamilton, as well as to support our newcomers to our community who desire to build Hamilton's home. Thank you for your continued support, work, ethos, and courage supporting the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion. Ashe. Thank you, Crystal, uh, for the introductory message and uh, a welcome to everyone uh, that is joining us and uh, giving an overview of uh, what we've been up to, uh, at least uh, from a high level here at HCCI. Um, we are joined, we, we, we had another board, uh, another board member join, uh, Cameron. And then uh, we might we might have other board members joining from time to time. Uh, so once once they once they pop up, we'll see if they can join in. And uh, later on during our, our our program here, if they want to say a couple of words, they might say a couple of words. So um, we we I'm going to give an overview of our annual report. You can find our annual report on our website. We posted it so that folks uh, can have uh, can have a copy of it if uh, if they want to read it or spend time with it. So uh, for the year 2019-2020, uh, uh, our programming focused on Black Youth Mentorship. We had an anti-racism conference. We, we engaged in many anti-hate initiatives. Uh, we provided equity, diversity, and inclusion training, as well as anti-oppression and uh, anti-racism training for uh, many organizations across uh, Hamilton and uh, sometimes in, in Ontario. We were also uh, able to start our own Hamilton Civic Leadership, Leadership uh, Program. Many of these uh, uh, programs that we started were funded uh, by the Ministry of uh, Children, Community and Social Services through the Ontario government, through the Black Mentorship uh, Action Program. We also received uh, funding from uh, the Ministry of uh, Canadian Heritage that allowed us to host the, uh, host the anti-racism conference and also start the Hamilton Civic Leadership Program. And so we are thankful to our funders. Uh, we, we, throughout, throughout the year, we've been able to uh, 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 do some of this work and we are grateful for um, all the support that they've been, uh, they've been able to give us. So uh, our Black Youth Mentorship Program. So our Black Youth Mentorship Program, the objective is to improve the emotional well-being of black children and youth by increasing access to consistent adults and also to ensure that uh, black youth across Hamilton have access to uh, employment and other forms of uh, entrepreneurship, uh, also engage in educational achievement, civic engagement, and building strong cultural identity. Our Black Youth Mentorship Program has seen us partner with the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board and an up-and-coming uh, uh, non-for-profit, Black-led uh, non-for-profit by the name of Never Going to Stop. During this partnership, we've been able to have group sessions uh, at the Bernie Custer Secondary School. And uh, for the next uh, year, we, are, we will be expanding to the McNabb Secondary School up on the mountain. Some of the sessions that we've had uh, with, the, with the students involve art expression, talking about financial literacy, in relation to their personal development and their career development, talking about community work, being involved in the community, providing uh, 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 leadership in the community. And so those are the things that we've been uh, 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 engaged in 
with, uh, with black youth. Our group mentorship program has been able to connect with 50 youth at the Benny Custis Secondary School. In addition, the Never Going to Stop organization has also been working with over 100 youth across the city. Some of the things that uh, they've been working on is access to uh, recreation, especially on the mountain, working on uh, um, the many uh, barriers that youth uh, in, in, in our city face, particularly uh, African Francophone youth when it comes to language. So those, those are the things that uh, youth are talking about and youth are trying to, to address. In our Black Youth Mentorship Program, we also have a one-to-one -one, uh, uh, program that pairs a mentor with a mentee. With this program, we've been able to connect with uh, many organizations here in Hamilton, such as the YMCA Newcomers Youth Council, the Ghana Association of Hamilton, and the Space. We've also been able to do some work with, Mac with McMaster's Office of Community Engagement, talking and having conversations about access to post-secondary education for Black families and Black youth. We entered into a partnership with Queen's University uh, to be able to uh, have Black youth travel to Queen's University in terms of uh, 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 seeing if that is going to be an option uh, for their education. As COVID has, uh, uh, has, has uh, played a big role now, we're going to have to re-envision what, what that would look like. We've also done some work with the John C. Holland Award, trying to uh, uh, connect youth with uh, the history of uh, Reverend John C. Holland and the work that many, many black organizations are doing here in Hamilton. We've also been able to make partnership across the city, including a movie screening that we had at the Westdale Theater. So these uh, are some of the activities that the one-to-one -one black, the one-to-one -one black youth mentorship program has been engaging in. To date, we've been able to pair 35 youth with black mentors across Hamilton. For our upcoming year, we hope to continue uh, the support and we hope uh, that we'll be able to have we'll be able to have uh, uh, more mentors, more mentees and also discuss uh, the ever increasing challenges that black youth uh, black youth uh, are facing across the city. We were able to start the Hamilton Civic Leadership Program, through funding from Canadian Heritage. The Civic Leadership Program offers engaging and participatory sessions designed to deepen critical understanding of democracy, civic engagement, civic inclusion, and community organizing skills that can be used to develop leadership skills and promote civic inclusion and engagement among youth. Special attention was given to Black, Indigenous, trans, and non-binary youth in Hamilton and surrounding areas. This con the concept for the program was first created by City of Hamilton Councillor Narinda Nan before her time as councillor. And we've, we've adapted that initial, initial version. We're happy to let you know that at least this is gonna be a two year program that is funded by the, by the Canadian Heritage Department. Our first cohort of students, we had 35 youth, 35 BIPOC youth that were heavily engaged in different aspects of uh, civic inclusion and civic engagement. We would like to thank all the facilitators uh, that spent quality time with, uh, with youth discussing things that were important to them and also sharing their personal uh, stories. Our work around civic inclusion and civic engagement is broad. 
there are many avenues in which civic inclusion and civic engagement uh, uh, manifest itself in the city of Hamilton. In this work, we've been able to partner with uh, civic engagement and democracy groups in Toronto, such as the Democracy Exchange uh, that is headquartered at uh, Ryerson University. I'd like to thank John Beebe and all the great work he's done to uh, increase voter turnout and uh, talk about uh, Canadian uh, residents uh, being engaged in a political process. During the federal election, we were able to connect, connect with over 30 representatives from 10 organi organizations, and we spoke to them about uh, the vote pop-up. The vote pop-up is a voter simulation that ensures inclusive and vibrant democracy in Canada by demystifying the voting process, connecting people's concerns and hopes to an election, and building a culture of engagement. We were able to connect with organizations such as Environment Hamilton, YWCA, and a number of women's shelters. We held uh, trainings that allowed these organizations to carry out the vote pop-up within their organizations and in their specific communities. We also partnered with Election Canada to have a vote clinic to ensure that the most vulnerable in our community have access to their democracy of voting. We would like to thank uh, the Hamilton Library for hosting all the workshops and also providing us uh, space to have these vote, vote pop-ups across uh, the city, from up the mountain to Stony Creek to Ancaster. So we thank the library for their partnership. Since the founding of the Hamilton Center for Civic Inclusion, we've always been committed to equity, diversity, and inclusion. And within that work, we talk about anti-oppression and anti-racism. Before uh, the racial reckoning that is happening this year, there were many organizations that were taking these issues seriously. And so we've been able to provide EDI, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and AOAR, Anti-Oppression, Anti-Racism Training, to a number of organizations, such as Pride Hamilton, the Hamilton Fringe, the Hamilton Library, Hamilton Health Sciences, uh, specifically the Internationally Educated Nurse Integration Project. We've also been able to provide this training uh, to a number of consultancy firms that are engaged in community engagement, uh, neighbor to neighbor, the space, the art gallery of Hamilton, uh, emergency medicine, resident doctors, and Redeemer College. We've also received numerous emails about equity, diversity, and inclusion training this year, uh, obviously with uh, all the discussions that are going, that are going on. And sometimes those discussions move into uh, uh, actual training or uh, sometimes we provide uh, some advice. We've also worked with a number of departments at the city of Hamilton, and uh, we are glad to always uh, support all the departments that reach out uh, to us. Anti-racism work in Hamilton. So uh, there, there are a number of organizations that have always been doing this type of work. HCCI has always uh, been at the forefront of this work. And uh, in, in 2015, City, City Council approved a three-year pilot project called the Hamilton Anti-Racism Resource Center. That was a partnership between uh, McMaster and our center. The purpose of the center was to track, collect incidents and stories of racism in Hamilton. The center was housed at our office, our, our, our former office in the uh, Effort Trust uh, building. And uh, we were happy and supportive of, uh, of the center. 
the center was paused in February 2019 to allow for more community engagement and stakeholder input to better define the center's mandate and activities for success. So uh, there were a number of public engagement activities that were conducted with city staff and recommendations were, were sent to city council uh, to re-establish the Hamilton Anti-Racism Resource Center with an independent board of directors. With that recommendation meant uh, a dissolution of the partnership agreement. And so uh, that dissolution happened. And now uh, there is actually a call out for uh, board members that wish to uh, continue with the work of the Hamilton Anti-Racism Resource Center. We continue to do uh, this work of anti-racism across the city uh, that involves supporting individuals uh, that have been impacted by racism, that also involves addressing systemic racism across various institutions uh, in our city. Uh, that means difficult, difficult conversations and, uh, and, uh, and, and huge tensions. Uh, but nonetheless, we know that we have to address these issues because is the, that's, that's the mandate of our organization. So we'll continue with that work. And we'd like to thank uh, those that are doing the work, Dr. Mew Joseph, Muna Bao from the Legal Clinic, uh, Sarah from the Disability Justice Network uh, of, of Ontario, and many others trying to uh, uh, work to ensure that we have a city uh, that is devoid of, uh, of racism. APCI has also uh, doing work towards uh, incoming uh, organizations that are also doing work to address uh, the most the most vulnerable in uh, in our community. And so, with that, we've received funding uh, from the Ontario Trillium Foundation. That supporting uh, the, the work of the Disability Justice Network of Ontario. The Disability Justice Network of Ontario uh, aims to create a way that people with disabilities are free to be. They've done so much work uh, in and across Ontario. Uh, one of their key, their, their key campaign work be the snow and tail campaign that uh, focused uh, the issue of snow clearing here in, in Hamilton. We've also been uh, doing uh, official work around lack of information and data around uh, issues that affect people living with invisible and visible disabilities. We've also been supporting Rafiki East mission is supporting members of the Congolese community in Hamilton and other African Africans in Canada where their personal and professional development and integration to Canada is central. They've been providing programs such as computer skills training, workshops for uh, Canadian citizenship, G1 test preparation, childcare, and uh, inter interpretation services. <laughs> well, it, 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 these things always happen when you're doing when you're doing an online event and uh, and internet connections seem to be seem to be breaking up. So uh, I uh, well, what what can I say? Even if I said I apologize, it won't it 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 it, it won't solve the issue. Nonetheless, um, uh, the good thing is that. Uh, our AGM is being recorded, so you can always uh, uh, tune in later and, and watch. But for those of you that are still sticking around, that's, uh, uh, that's the work that we've been doing. And I highlighted the, the great work that uh, the Black Led Youth Group Never Gonna Stop is also doing. Um, so uh, we, 
we we are happy to support them and they'll continue to do the work that uh, they are going to do to ensure their community is safe. Um, most of you have met some of our board members. Uh, some are not here. Uh, so Crystal, Crystal Mark is our chair. Daniel Giulietti is our vice chair. Amy Majani is our treasurer. Cameron Coach is our interim secretary. We have Sabrina Sibold, Michelle Pore, Suki Dillon, Tina Garnett, Denise Mar Maraj, uh, Thomas Sule, Brenda uh, Begumisa, Jamil Miller, and uh, Councillor Maureen Wilson. Uh, I would also I would also I would also like to uh, I would also like to thank our dedicated staff, uh, our, dedic our dedicated staff, Sarah Jama, our senior program coordinator, Samson Dicamo, uh, our Black Youth Mentorship Coordinator, and Rose Senate uh, Black Youth Mentorship Coordinator. Would also like to thank uh, Mohammed Mohammed, who was uh, the the coordinator for the anti-racism conference. Our bookkeeper Lucy Mesquita, and uh, we also had uh, we always have student uh, student placements here at HCCI. A uh, big a big 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 shout out to Tatim Hussein. Uh, from McMaster University, Social Work, School of so Social Work, and Rohit Prasad um, uh, from York University. So um, it's, we always, I, I, I find it interesting, we're, we're, we're a center that does a lot of uh, community uh, work, anti-racism work, when we always get social work uh, placement. So uh, I don't know, maybe we're social work, social workers at heart so i'd like to thank them as well and uh i always i always like to um thank former executive directors of this organization because um i think i am here because of all the work that they have done so uh former executive directors evelyn Myrie, johanna Otiti, and uh, matthew green um, I think it's always important that we pay homage to those that have come uh, before us. And our last thanks go to all the organizations that uh, that support us. And uh, anytime they support us, our support is reciprocated. So Akon Hamilton, uh, the Afro-Canadian Caribbean Association, Broadband Institutes, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, the City of Hamilton, Empowerment Square, the Empowerment Hamilton, Flyprint, uh, the Public School Board, the Hamilton District Labor Council, Hamilton Immigration Partnership Council, Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, Hamilton Community Benefits Network, the Immigrants Working Center, McMaster University, the Equity and Inclusion Office, and the uh, Office of Community Engagement, and the School of Social Work, the Sexual Assault Center, Hamilton and Area, Social Planning Research Council, the Space, and last but not the least, the YWCA. So thank you uh, to, uh, to all of you for supporting us and we'll continue to uh, support you um, as well. And so that is the uh, annual report. <laughs> um, if if there are folks that are watching that have questions, uh, you're more than welcome to uh, put in put in the questions, and maybe I I will respond uh, I will respond uh, later. And so now I'll have to pass it on uh, to our treasurer Amy, and uh, Amy is going to go over our, give a, a brief overview of our audited statements. And, uh, yeah, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kojo. Um, I would like to, first of all, uh, thank staff for the adjustments they have made during COVID-19 and also the cooperation and adjustments that the board has made as well in terms of its oversight over the organization. 
uh, going by the audited financial statements for the fiscal year 2019-2020, I am glad to inform the membership that uh, as per the audited, as per the auditor's reports, um, HCCI's financial statements barely present activities, finance, the financial position and the cash flows of the organization. I am also happy to report that uh, HCCI had a surplus. Uh, it's a small surplus, but given that we are a community organization that's allowed for, it's uh, 2,146. Uh, this is a marked improvement from uh, the last fiscal year, uh, 2019, sorry, 2018, 2019, where we had a deficit of 17,064 cents. No, 17,000. $64. Um, so congratulations to staff for judiciously spending all that money on programs and operations for the organization. Uh, in terms of uh, revenues, uh, there's been a significant, there was a significant growth of revenues uh, from 2018, where we had three, around 311,000 uh, to nearly half a million, that's 532,000 for fiscal year 2019-2020. Uh, most of this can be attributed to the new programs and funding from the Ministry of Canadian Heritage and Multiculturalism, uh, notably going to the Democracy School Program and the Anti-Racism Conference. I'm sorry if I'm going too fast, I'll try and slow down. But uh, it should also be noted that this is a one-time funding and for the future of the organization, we will need for, for this fiscal year that we are in and the upcoming years, we'll need to seek more funding. Um, so if you haven't signed up for membership or paid your membership dues, uh, please go to the HCCI's website and yeah, and support HCCI. Um, so it's a short presentation. Uh, with that, I would like to move, I'd need a seconder, Cameron. So I move uh, Cameron's Crouch seconds that the membership approved the audited financial statements for the period ending March 31st, 2020. How would we go about that? Yes, yeah, so 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 uh since since most of the board members the board members are here, you would you would have to uh accept accept that and okay. then uh and then we'll, we would we'll pass on that information to, to everyone. All right, thank you. Uh, I have a second motion. Uh, I move, Cameron, would you like to second again? <laughs> thank you. I move and uh, Cameron seconds that uh, the membership approve that HCCI retain the services of our current auditors. That's Petinelli, and I'm going to butcher the last name. Uh, Mastro Luisi, uh, Chartered Accountants for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. So, right. yes, thank you. Um, I, that's it for me. Um, if, you, if anyone has further questions or would like more details on the financial statements, I do have a more detailed analysis and I'd be glad to share it with anyone who's interested. Thank you so much. Ah, that's it for me. Okay, thank you, thank you, Amy. So uh, we have we have we have a number of board members. Uh, so would any any of the board members that are present want to say uh, anything before we we shift in before we shift to hear from our guest speaker? Okay, um, what what I'll do is maybe <laughs> uh, it looks it looks like all all our all our board board members are quiet now. I can I I can say during board meetings they're very very uh, talkative, but it looks like uh, at our AGM they don't want to talk that much. Uh, Crystal. Yeah, I would like to say that, you know, we're we're a normally very discussion heavy group. I think we might just be a little bit zoomed out or, 
you know, uh, video called out. Um, but we do think that um, we all think highly and in, like very highly of the work that staff has put in. We think very highly of the volunteer work and all the initiatives that have become, that are were ad hoc this year, such as care mongering and organizing at City Hall. All of these pieces we're extremely proud of. And we, um, it's been a pleasure for all of us to help support the organization. Okay, and then uh, next up we have Councillor Maureen Wilson. Thank you, Kojo. I, I just take a few seconds to say um, that it has been my absolute delight and great honor to be the city's representative on this board. Um, the future of this city um, is going to be dependent on our ability to reconcile um, our faults and our inequities and to chart uh, together a course forward that recognizes the value and the contribution of each individual um, that we can strive together. Sometimes that will require very difficult conversations and the telling of hard truths, but we would do a disservice to this city if we avoided that and took the easy path. And I'm very proud of the work of uh, this, inst this civic institution um, and I'd like to thank you for your your leadership and to all members of staff and to our chair and all board members um, for your contributions in making Hamilton a better place. We have much work to do. I'm confident that if we give everyone an opportunity to do so and recognize everyone's inherent value, we will make our city stronger. Thank you very, very much. Hey. Thank you, Councillor Wilson, and thank you for uh, always, always uh, spending time with us as, at our board meetings. Uh, we look forward to continued uh, work with you and collaboration and difficult conversations as <laughs> as, as always. Uh, so yes, yeah, so uh, now we're going to move into uh, what we. In the last, I would say in the last two or three years, uh, we try to uh, uh, add a speaking component uh, to our AGM because we want to, we want to, <laughs> we want to make sure that um, we are we are we're staying on top of uh, things that are happening not only in the province but also in our community, and uh, so. Uh, we have a guest speaker with us, Nick. Hi, everybody. Yes, Nick. Nick is joining us, and um, Nick is going to join us to talk about uh, rank ballots. Uh, for those, I mean, in the last month or so, rank ballots has become a, a provincial discussion uh, across uh, uh, across. Uh, all the municipalities that are in the in the province, and so uh, when these discussions were going on, I uh, we were wondering what uh, what work has been done uh, around rank ballots in Hamilton, and uh, none other than Nick and a couple of people that he's worked with have delegated at uh, council on the issue of rank ballots. So I thought it would be uh, it would be timely. To hear from the work that uh, Nick has been doing, and also to share with us why uh, rank ballots um, uh, might build better inclusive democracy. So, uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Nick, and then Nick is going to say a couple of words, and then we'll have a conversation about rank ballots. And we still have some board members around, so uh, maybe once you are done. Maybe there might be a, a couple of board members that might even have questions for you. So, Nick, Perfect. it's all yours. Wonderful. Uh, well, I, I really just want to sincerely say, uh, honestly, really, really thank you for inviting me on to give this issue its due and to give it a hearing. It's a really important issue. It's it's near and dear to my heart. Um, particularly, there's actually a couple of familiar faces in this room. Um, who've uh, both helped me with this issue in the past, 
um, and supported it um, from a, a perspective of sitting on council. So thank you to both Cameron and uh, Councillor Wilson for supporting efforts uh, towards ranked ballots in this city in the past. Um, all the applause to both of you. Um, and thank you, uh, Kojo, for inviting me. And thanks to everyone else for still being here and, and just sitting in on this conversation. Um, I don't know if we can do a show of hands. Is that a thing people do on, on these calls? But um, what's, I, I just want to get a sense of how many people here know and don't know what ranked ballots are. Does anyone not know what ranked ballots are? think just give it a few more seconds for for an answer to emerge all right i'm going to launch into the quickest possible explanation um, that i can that i can possibly do on ranked ballots which is often um sort of cast as a really complicated really niche political issue that only super activists or or political um you know experts really care about and um in reality that might be the case right now but um you know one of the things i'm here to do is to try and make the case um as to why I think ranked ballots should be a mainstream issue and why it's something that can positively affect everybody and really make politics more accessible uh, to people from different communities, including marginalized, racialized communities, and also um, to people who are not in the upper crust elites, uh, one or 10% of society. Uh, ranked ballots is a way to change the way that we vote in elections. Um, it can be done at any level. It can be done with a city election, be done at the provincial level or at the federal level. Uh, the work that I've done in the past focuses on changing ranked ballots um, and bringing in the, the ranked ballot system for city elections. Um, and that work has been done by many people all across Ontario. It's been done by me personally, uh, both here in Hamilton and in Toronto as well. Um, ranked ballots, um, the, the way it works is, first off, you can only win the election if you, the candidate running in the election, gets at least 50% of the vote. So right away, it, get, it gets rid of one of the major problems of first past the post voting, which is what we have right now, where you can conceivably win an election with only 31 or 32% or of the vote. Um, you see that all the time in the current system, both in city elections and elections at other levels in Canada. But with ranked ballots, you solve that problem right away because you have to have at least half of the people voting for you to win. Um, so in this case, I think it's um, it's easiest to explain how this works if we frame it in terms of the major political parties. So if we have the Liberals, the NDP, Conservatives and the Green Party, um, what would an election between these four parties look like in a ranked ballot system? Um, so let's use myself as an example. Let's say that in this election, I in this ranked ballot election for you know my federal MP, theoretically, I really want to vote green. I'm a Green Party supporter, and I would love to see the Green wins. Now, the Greens win. Now, normally in a first past the post election. I would probably be motivated to vote for either the Liberals or the NDP because they align most closely, you know, sometimes maybe not um, with the Greens, but it's far preferable to the Conservatives. And depending on which way the wind is blowing, I might be scared to vote for one of those other two parties uh, in order to keep the Conservatives out, let's say. Um, but in a ranked ballot election, what I would do is I would vote for the Green Party. And then assuming that the Green Party didn't win and assuming that they actually came in last place, which typically is what happens, they get removed from the election. So they're out of the game. And then what happens to my ballot, a piece of paper that I actually voted on, is it changes from my first choice, which was the Green Party, to my second choice, which in this case would be the NDP. Um, so the vote for Green changes to a vote for NDP and it gets counted as an NDP vote in a second round of counting. And then it goes to a third round if nobody wins again, if no one crosses that 50% threshold of having one half the vote. So in this case, 
my, oh yeah, that, that's great for um, posting that article there for anyone who wants to dig in further. Um, but in, in this case that I'm talking about, the NDP vote um, that was formerly a green vote would maybe then be counted if nobody reached 50%, it would switch to my third choice, uh, which again, in my case, would be a liberal vote. Um, and that most likely would give the liberals the election and keep the conservatives out. So from a partisan standpoint, this is why I really like ranked ballots. Um, I think it's a, it's a great way to sort of redistribute um, the power of electoral politics in this country. Right now, things are kind of slanted uh, towards the conservatives. They have a lot of disproportionate power. Um, they get a lot of those sparsely populated rural ridings, and it's not really fair from a, a population standpoint. But there's a lot of other reasons why it's good too. Um, and specifically with, you know, according to the mission values of HCCI, I want to talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, Ariel uh, Kayabaga in London, Ontario was the first black woman elected to, well, any elected position in London, Ontario. And this happened uh, in 2018 during the country's first ever ranked ballot election. Um, so London, Ontario did have a ranked ballot election. We've only ever had one. Um, and not only was she elected, but th they also elected their first openly gay counselor. And um, both of these people have said in interviews that they would not have run had the system remained the same, um, you know, as it was before under first past the post. Um, so, you know, anecdotally, there's some pretty strong stories uh you know coming from sort of the horse's mouth from people themselves who've run in this system um one thing we know is that ranked ballot elections do lead to a less negative politics uh which is another reason why it interests me specifically so uh, in the past i've actually done work in politics and i've volunteered on a lot of political campaigns um, and you really get a, a real sense of the gr gritty realities and the negativity that can come out of political campaigns when everyone is attacking each other and uh, saying, oh, you know, don't vote for this guy, don't vote for that lady, you know, she sucks, he, he's lame. Um, with ranked ballots, because the vote works in, a, in a, a ranking sort of way, it benefits you as a candidate who's running to not attack other candidates. It benefits you much, much more to try and befriend other candidates and befriend their supporters and say, hey, you know, you might not pick me as your first choice, but I think it would be really great if you picked me as your second choice. Um, so th this becomes sort of the mission in a ranked ballot election when you are the candidate or when you are the campaigner. And it's very different um, from what we see in, in Canada's typical first past the post elections, which, as I think we all know, is exhaustingly negative. Um, so that's sort of the main reason why why I really support it, because having lived through the toxicity of multiple political campaigns um, and, you know, done a lot of political work, some of which I'm proud of, some of which I'm not, that's directly motivated by the first past the post system. I, I would really like to see um, this system brought to an end. Um, I'm going to give myself a little break there and open it up to any questions. Yeah, so we, 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 we haven't had any questions come from Facebook, Twitter, or, or YouTube, but one question that um, I, I, uh, I had was, um, you know, I, when I heard you uh, delegate uh, at, at, uh, at City Hall, in municipal politics, there's always been uh, this idea of uh, incumbency. Right, and so uh, how would how would ranked ballots, you know, uh, influence or or address that? Great question. So, yes, the it, it is notoriously difficult to displace an incumbent. Uh, anyone who's run for municipal politics probably knows this. Anyone who's worked on a municipal campaign probably knows this. It's like ninety nine percent. Um, that you will not win, uh, even if you are truly the best candidate and have the best policies and have everything going for you, uh, unless there's something really, really, really wrong with your incumbent, like they, you know, um, got hit by a car and have been in, living in the hospital for the last two months of the campaign or something like that. 
Um, otherwise, it's probably not going to happen. Usually, uh, getting a council seat usually is a multi-election strategy, unless you have uh, cases where there's an open seat, as we did in wards one and three in 2018. Um, then it's a it's sort of a different game. Um, now, uh, to your question, one thing that incumbent candidates do when they're trying to get themselves reelected, they understand very well that the municipal electorate is very different from the provincial or the federal electorate. They don't vote necessarily along partisan lines. Sometimes they do, but much more often they vote along either incumbent or anti-incumbent lines. So they're simply voting for the same or change. And what um, some candidates will do, some incumbents rather, some sitting councillors who want to keep their seats, they will ask their buddies to run against them so that there are more anti-incumbents to split up the anti-incumbent slice of the pie. Um, so that's one dirty trick that um, often gets used and, and I suspect has been used in Hamilton. I, I haven't dug deep into Hamilton, so I don't um, know if that's the case, but I know for certain that it has happened in other cities and I've seen it happen in other cities. Um, I'm sure it happens here too. Uh, so ranked ballot eliminates this because it preserves um, the entirety of the anti-incumbent slice of the pie. So if you have 100 people voting in an election, let's say, right, 100% um, of people are voting in the election and 52% want to vote against the incumbent, um, they're easily going to win with 48% of the vote if the remaining 52% is split between five people. But in a ranked ballot system, all, all of those votes get counted. So there, there are no what we call wasted votes. Ranked ballot eliminates wasted votes. A wasted vote is when you vote for someone who probably isn't going to win and, and comes uh, in like very nearly last place, let's say. So if you have you know 10 people running an election and you voted for the person who ran um, and got seventh place in the election, your, your vote is considered wasted. Um, it doesn't count, it doesn't achieve anything, right? Whereas in a ranked ballot scenario, you can still vote for that person, but then you can rank the person who's much more likely to come um, in second place, let's say, or the person who is making a very strong running against the incumbent who is arguably much better the, than the incumbent, but might not be as aligned to your heart as you know the seventh place person that you voted against. So your vote gets counted and, and it goes towards the person who's likely to win. Um, so that is a, you know, that, that basically answers your question. Mm -hmm. So, but just one more follow up, and then I think uh, Cameron has a question. So, um, you know, so this idea of a wasted ballot. So, in essence, ranked ballots will ensure that everybody has a, a voice in who their leader is, right? Absolutely. So, you 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 don't you no longer have representatives who got in with thirty percent of the vote. Um, it just it doesn't exist in a ranked ballot system. It can't. It's, it's a mathematical impossibility. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Cameron. Hey, Nick. Uh, thanks so much for being here and for talking about ranked balloting, which you know I'm super passionate about. I had one quick question for you, which was, what do you think, you know, just maybe one thing that the City of London did that you think uh, contributed to getting folks there um, behind this, um, making it successful? I mean, they're going to be running... Uh, well, maybe not. Hopefully running again with a ranked balloting system if things change. Um, and just wondering what you think London did that maybe Hamilton could do too um, that really got that ball rolling. Okay, so this is great. You're going to love this. Um, I love this when I, when I heard it because I asked them the same question. And this is what they told me. They said, we ran. So I, I asked the ranked ballot activist crowd in, in London, hey, what did you guys do that Toronto isn't doing, that Hamilton isn't doing? And they just said, we ran. We ran for council and we won. And the, like the next day, we implemented ranked ballots. So, um, you know, to connect that to what we can do here in Hamilton, um, after the the um, delegation, the deputation that we made, Cameron uh, and Kojo, you you were there too, um, and Councillor Wilson, you were there too. Um, but after that deputation, uh, my heart was sort of crushed. And I mean, I didn't really expect to win going into it, but then I had done all this background work and we, we can get more into this later. And I thought I had the votes. And then a couple of the people who told me they were gonna vote for it, voted against it uh, or they didn't vote. 
and then it, it failed in a tie um, and I was crushed and I went home and I just said, okay, well, that's, that's it. I have to wait another four years. So th that's it. What we need to do is we need to kick out some of the old guard. We need to focus our efforts on removing some of the people from those very stale seats. And once they're gone, we try again. So all, all of my political energy has gone to waiting, staying sane. Well, I, I watched the dumpster fire that is Hamilton Council in its current iteration, and eventually picking up my bootstraps and, and going again with help. I like that. I like that. I like that idea, um, Nick. It's very important to keep going, especially at the municipal level, because at the municipal level, it's difficult because you don't have the financial support that you do at the federal and provincial levels, and it takes a number of iterations to move forward. But you are right. There is some. There is, um, with Councillor Maureen being a very strong exception, of course. There is some. Um, there is some sweeping of house that needs to happen. Um, and so uh, I definitely think this system needs to be implemented. Wonderful. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I lack a filter sometimes, uh, especially when it comes to political things that frustrate me greatly. Um, you might be able to tell I have some strong feelings about this, but I'm, I'm trying to keep it uh, inside. <laughs> what so is what is the purpose with, of, of life without strong feelings um, around social political issues? It, it ha it's meaningless. You're, you're absolutely right. What am I doing? <laughs> so we, we have a question. We have a question. Uh, voter turnout for municipal elections in Hamilton have been embarrassingly low for years. Do you mm -hmm. think rank ballot would energize or engage the electorate? Absolutely. Uh, it's a no, it's a no brainer. I, you know, do, will there be uh, some people who grumble about it and go, ah, you know, why, why are they changing the ballots? Like what's going, then that's fine. You don't, you don't have to use a ranked ballot. It's just that if we implement the option for ranked ballots, suddenly Hamil a Hamilton municipal election goes from being like a niche wonk nerd thing to get excited about to like a really fun, sexy, like, oh, you know, Hamilton's doing something cool and different and it'll be in the news a whole bunch. And uh, it'll, I think it will get people very excited. Um, so let me, let, me ask, let me ask another question. As others are thinking about their questions and we wait for people on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter to send in questions. Um, uh, the, city, the city of London, so they, uh, they, they enact this uh, rank ballot system. And before I get there, so first of all, uh, uh, provincially, it has, it, it, it has to be given, uh, it has to be uh, a provision that mun municipalities can, can even do, right? So right. I, I believe it was Ted, Ted McMeekin uh, and, and, uh, and the previous government that provided that option. So, That's right in 2016. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, if th there was also an argument about changing the cost, the cost of of implementing rank ballots, right? right. So, um, can you comment about the the cost? Yeah, it's it's um, a minuscule percentage of a city budget. Um, any city, any any big city like Hamilton or London spends probably at least 10 times more per year on putting pylons on the roads as a placeholder for city budgetary figures than they would on implementing a ranked ballot election. Uh, maybe Maureen knows this. Um, so, you know, that's a thing. Um, so it's really small. And then the question that I would fire back, because it's a question that the opponents of ranked ballot typically ask, and it's a question we got asked at that council meeting, um, the question that I would respond to that question with is, can you put a price on better democracy? Because that's what this is. It, it is it's better democracy. The votes that we have now, the first pass the post vote, if you look at it like a, an instrument or a tool, a vote is ultimately a tool with which you exercise your right to democratic participation. The tool we're using right now is is blunt. It's, it's a hammer. It's a baseball bat. It's a blunt instrument. It's uh, caveman stuff. 
And a ranked ballot is a more sophisticated, um, more elegant way of exercising that same right, but in a much more precise and much more meaningful way. And for me, that's something that's that's worth any penny, like every penny, you can't really put a price on it. Um, and if you are going to put a price on it, if you're going to be one of those those people, um, then I would say, you know, it, it's minuscule. It's really not that expensive at all. Um, we we have a question. Someone, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this. They were, they were asking, uh, didn't Premier Ford just kill rank balloting? Sure did. Yeah, he, he set back the effort uh, by probably about 10 years. And uh, so, oh, we have Crystal. Can you explain how, like, can, I, I just, I know that he sort of got rid of it, but how, how, how is it that it will take us 10 years to get this back? Because 10 years is almost a generation, right? So in 10 years, the children I have in school will be already voting. So I, I want to know how is it that we can make that change? Because v ranked voting gives choices to people it, yeah. it gives them more weight with their vote right it's not just one but there's up to three options that they can have so there's more choice and i do think that's sexy and i do think that that would be um something that people could get behind right and it, and it is something that people have gotten behind they got behind it in london um they've been increasingly getting behind it in toronto and it was very close to passing in toronto i, I have on very good authority which is why I think it got killed when it did. Um, and it, it's also been um, gaining steam and winning referenda uh, in multiple cities, in like five or six cities across Ontario have all voted recently uh, within the last two years to switch their elections to ranked ballots or to either look at doing implementation studies on ranked ballots. So it, it was picking up. Um, so to give you, um, you know, a fulsome answer as to how this happened and what happened, um, in 2016, um, thanks to the work of ranked ballot activists and election reform activists who came before me, uh, the Kathleen Wynne government implemented um, the Elections Modernization Act, which all it did, it didn't implement ranked ballots, it didn't change anything. What it did is it gave municipalities the right to determine their own electoral systems. So formerly, we were all just locked in to first pass the post. And this bill in 2016, this provincial bill, just said, hey, cities, if you want to have a vote, uh, or if you if you as a council want to determine um, that you know a reformed election system is better for your city, go for it. Um, so we got a new right. Yay, right? That's a, it's a great thing. How could anyone argue that? And it didn't cost anything either. Um, fast forward to um, last month, and, you know, right as the American election is building up um, and everybody's eyes are on that, Doug Ford uh, and his government in the dead of night introduce this new COVID recovery uh, legislation, like the better businesses and more money for Ontario Act or something similarly stupid and Orwellian um, like that. So they introduced this bill and in the bill, the, the, main, um, the main thrust, let's say, of the bill is that long-term care homes um, during the era of pandemic, if they're, they're residents, if the people staying in the long-term care homes catch COVID and die as a result of poor hygiene practices at the care home, the care home can't be sued. So that was the thrust of Bill 218. And we're gonna take away the rights granted to municipalities from the Municipal, uh, Municipal uh, Elections Modernization Act. We're going to take away the right for cities to choose how they do their own election, uh, which, my God, is just so counter and hypocritical to the conservatives' favorite notion that they're all in favor of smaller government and, and getting out of the way and not telling people how to live their lives. So there it is. And, and that's where we are. The bill just passed. So it was like a tag on. It was a tag on. Oh, I hate those tag ons. Okay. I hate those tag ons too, Crystal. <laughs> so, so I, I, uh, I, I post, I posted, uh, I posted the uh, the link to Bill two eighteen, and um, some others are also asking, don't um, 
uh, indi uh, individual political parties use rank ballots to uh, decide their leader of the political party? They do. They do. It's my first time uh, voting with a ranked ballot myself. Um, was in a, a party leadership election. If you voted, if anyone here voted in the um, 20, was it 2017 or 18 NDP leadership election that selected Jagmeet Singh, that was a ranked ballot. Um, so if you voted there, you're familiar with ranked ballots. If you voted for any, any liberal election, ranked ballot. Um, and, you know, I tell you, once you go ranked, you never go back. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, if it, and if it's good enough for them, why isn't it good enough for us? Is a is a question I'm always fond of raising to opponents. Mm -hmm. So so then where 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 do we go from here? Because I think uh, the the argument for rank ballots. Uh, <laughs> you have me wanting to repeat your tagline, but nonetheless. <laughs> so. Um, where yes, where 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 do we go from from now? I uh, I believe wasn't there a private a private members bill from uh, MPP? Uh, Mitzi, yeah, Mitzi's been a big friend of the ranked ballot movement, um, a, and we have many friends, uh, but she is one of the biggest. Uh, she's been a steadfast supporter for as long as I've been involved in the movement. Um, so it, it felt very natural that she would be the one to table the bill. I like it, it won't pass, right? There, there's there's nothing to do. The conservatives have um, an iron grip on their party discipline, so nobody is going to vote uh, in, in, on that side. Like I would be very surprised if any of them broke ranks. Certainly, uh, you know, my, um, Mike Schreiner, uh, the entire NDP, the entire Liberal caucus, all of them will vote in favor of Mitzi's bill, and, and I think that's wonderful as a as a show of support for ranked. Um, as a, you know, something that keeps ranked in the news and keeps people talking about it. The more people talk about it, the better. Um, cause it's something, it's an obscure issue that not a lot of people know about. And once they know about it, they're like, oh, this makes so much sense. Like why, why haven't we been doing this all along? Um, so it's something that can make noise and, and lend more media and public attention to the issue, but it's not going to pass. I would be very, very surprised if it passed. And I think we would be wasting our energy um, trying to advocate to get it to pass. So what I'm interested in is more of a long game. Um, you know, same as my, it's, it's the, I feel very demoralized right now. I'll, I'll level with you, but um, it's the same reaction I had after that council meeting here in Hamilton um, two, two years ago. Um, we walk away and we come back at the next election and we make sure that we change the makeup of provincial parliament. We have to. That's the only choice, um, because with a super majority in place, which is what Doug Ford has, he can basically do anything he wants. Uh, and as soon as 218 uh, came on our radar, uh, you know, we we knew, OK, there's nothing we can do to stop this because there, there isn't. So we have to wait until he's gone um, or or wait until his power is much diminished. And then we can work at bringing it back um, through, you know, the province granting municipal re-granting, re-re-granting municipalities the right to implement these electoral systems. And then we continue the work on the municipal level. That would be the the official way to go about it. And that's what the sensible half of my brain says we should do. Uh, the insensible half of my brain says that uh, what you know possibly might be considered is a city like London where they'd already implemented it. And obviously the entire council felt very passionately about uh, doing so, including the mayor who's quite conservative. Um, they should just do it again. What is what is the province going to do if they hold another ranked ballot election? What What is going to happen? Are they gonna send the OPP in and say, sorry, like what, what will happen? I want, I want to know, honestly, like somebody tell me what they will do. I don't think there's anything they can do. So I, I think it would be a, a very interesting turn if London decided to stick with its ranked ballot system for the upcoming election. But but in that case, isn't isn't the provincial election always before the municipal? It's just before. So, yeah. OK. Yeah. So 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 if if uh, 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 if they decide to continue with with uh, with with rank ballots, I assume they've they've purchased material, they've they've machines and all of and all of that. So there's no reason to go back to first past the post, right? No, yeah, no, of course not. And and they're like, I'll I'll just say it frankly, they're pissed in London because they they invested so much work 
uh, into bringing about the system, both in terms of advocacy, public education, um, you know, the infrastructure, the study, all of it, right? And, and now to have to turn around, it's it's like a big, um, it's a bummer. <laughs> We, we have a question. Uh, so uh, the question is, has rank ballot had any effect on the amount of candidates in a particular elect electoral district or roster? Right. Yeah. Um, yes, uh, it, it has, Elaine. Um, so it's known, it's quite notable uh, in London, you've got uh, Ariel Kaibaga, who is the first young black woman elected to London's council. Uh, you also have the first openly gay councillor in London and other cities that have implemented ranked ballots across the United States have reported similar things uh, with, you know, trans candidates uh, winning. I think I, I'm not sure if it was in Maine, um, but in one of the, the recent cities to implement ranked in the U.S., of which there have been many, um, you have the, the same pattern playing out again and again. And from a personal uh, perspective, one of the things that I did when I was working on political campaigns is you work actively in the beginning stages of a campaign to demoralize potential candidates from jumping in the race. So if you as a candidate want to run in a municipal race and you're quite serious about winning, one of the things that you ought to do is make yourself seem as big and intimidating as possible so that other people are scared from jumping into the race with you. And th this is something that I personally did for people when I did political work. And um, it's something that I would I would like for people not to have to do again. And in a ranked system, that eliminates the need for any, any of those sorts of shenanigans. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have, uh, now the questions are coming in. <laughs> uh, could the premier interfere with London's election like he did with Toronto's? Yes. So the Toronto case in 2018 was a big red flag for, for me and for, you know, dem democratic process nerds. Um, once that happened and he was able to get away with it, the, the writing was actually on the wall for me then. I was actually quite scared then that Bill 218 would happen at some point during Ford's term um, because, you know, creatures of the province and that whole thing, that whole line, that whole legal precedent, um, that says, you know, yes, the premier can unilaterally uh, interfere and completely mess with an election. In, in that case, in the middle of the election, um, putting so many people out, candidates who had invested so much time and resources, and even just making the decision to run, uh, assuming that certain rules of the game held true, and then it was all upended on them. So if he could do that, then he could certainly do this now. He's absolutely within his uh, what has been established by recent 2018 precedent as his legal right, um, you know, for better or worse. We, we have a comment here. Uh, it says the provincial government can do anything it wants with a city or municipality, like yeah. defend London Council and appoint a minister to run London. The court challenges after that would rather be interesting. Very much so. And th this this is where our conversation, uh, you know, the, the insensible half of my brain, um, this comment, this is where the conversation veers into territory uh, that's similar to what the Charter City movement is advocating for and where they come in. I, I don't know if people here are familiar with the Charter City folks, um, but they basically advocate for legal changes that would give cities their own autonomous rights independent from the pro province. So that whole creatures of the province thing that came out of um, the Toronto um, shenanigans in 2018 to get, basically get rid of that and um, write it into you know Canadian federal law, um, even a, a, like some sort of constitutional amendment that to say cities do have their own inalienable rights uh, that the province cannot trample on. So if, if, if people want to find out more about the charter cities, what, what's, what, what, what's the, can you share that information? Yeah, let me, um, I think the, the biggest one, and I know this is a Hamilton group and uh, like I live in Hamilton too, um, but the website you'd want to go to because these folks have it together the most when it comes to charter cities is chartercitytoronto.ca. Okay. Okay. 
okay yeah we've 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 shared it so that folks can uh if folks want to see what it's about join that movement uh they can they can they can do so uh, yeah, I, 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 I have I have another plug to make. Um, okay, so th this this is the one I really want to make because uh, you know we got to do something, right? So I, I don't know what exactly we're going to do yet and what exactly it's going to look like, but um, me and the ranked ballot folks uh, across Ontario have started building some new infrastructure uh, for a new long game movement to lend some noise uh, to this issue and hopefully get. The financial support of some big institutional donors as well um, so that we can really put some power behind this going into the next provincial election uh, so the website here is localchoice.info all it all it is right now it gives a nice little summary of the issue uh, for anyone who's not familiar with it and if you want to sign the petition which eventually some years from now once it's built up to several thousand people uh, we will pass along to um, our friends in government okay wow this is yeah no this is this is this is helpful i think uh i i i think that uh this is this is exactly uh, the type of uh, connections that we need to make in terms of talking about, you know, um, equity uh, issues when when it's related to electoral politics and 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 democracy, right? Building inclusive uh, democracies. Uh, so, are there any questions from our board members? They're all oh, Crystal. Yeah, Dave. Dave has been behind it, and um, it's it's good that you brought up Dave. I should talk about him. He is kind of the godfather of the ranked movement uh, in Ontario, and he's he's been helping us with local choice. Uh, so Dave is involved. He's on the team. Yeah, and I was going to say that like parts of his book, The Teardown, um, which I may have right behind me, um, they are. It's a really good book that talks about challenging our current systems of democracy. So, uh, give me one second. I can flash it on the camera. Great. So, um, for those that are those that are listening, uh, is there any final words you want to give them other than? them check in local choice and charter city toronto totally yeah um so for anyone who whose primary interest is in building a more inclusive a more diverse and a more particip participatory democracy um that opens doors for everyone um ranked ballots is a is a really good issue that you might want to pay attention to in in some it gives you more power so ranked ballots gives voters every voter including conservatives more power and if, if you believe there's more of us than there are of them which i do then that translates into a better government for us all thank you thank, thank you nick uh thank you nick i think uh oh there we have it we have the book uh tear down uh yeah uh here it is so tear down rebuilding democracy from the ground up so there's a lot there but rank ballots is in here for sure yeah I love, so, I love amy's comment i just want to throw that out there <laughs> <laughs> so uh uh yeah so uh this is this is what acci does you know we we share information we talk about difficult conversations we bring people together uh, so Nick, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, you know, for uh, for residents of residents of Hamilton, if you want to, you know, connect with Nick, please uh, please do so. Uh, there's so much organizing across the city that's happening, and uh, building inclusive democracy means lots of things, right? Uh, rank ballots, uh, making our spaces accessible, uh, talking about uh talking talk talking about um uh how how we react to a current pandemic that has accelerated so much inequity um across across the world in our city and these are things uh that that we we we, we need to we need to discuss and have 
Um, so yes, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to, I'm sharing your, uh, your Instagram handle in the, in the chat so that folks can get in touch with you and see how, um, they can they can join join in this work so that's my twitter yeah please please reach out and and kojo and everybody thank you so much for having me on tonight uh it's been really fun and uh it's been it's been really nice talking with you all okay thank you very much and we'll see you soon bye everybody <laughs> okay bye so uh I hope I hope everyone everyone that tuned in learned learned uh, oh there you go I hope everyone that tuned in uh, learned a lot um, you know as we continue to build an inclusive city these are the difficult conversations well uh, um, uh, Crystal said I shouldn't say difficult what, what, what was the word courageous conversation okay yes courageous conversations that we yeah that we need that we need to have so uh we'll we'll we'll, we'll continue to have them uh i think i think those are happening across the city uh right at the at the center of uh municipal governance right now uh they're they're black queer uh young uh organizers uh, trying to change the trajectory of of this city, uh, we've seen so much uh, uh, inequity and uh, the, the 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 blatant disregard for the most vulnerable in our community. So uh, these discussions will go on. Uh, people will organize. People will will uh, will engage. They will do long term planning. And there was one thing that Nick said that was very um, eye-popping for me, right? So we have a decision to stop rank ballots, and it's going to take, you know, 10, 20 years to change that tra trajectory. So let's think about decisions that have not been made or that have been made that allow for, you know, uh, residents across this city to decide to uh, pitch a tent and live in a in a park uh, that have uh, you know uh, people waiting on uh, on on public housing wait list, right? So we really we really have to roll up our sleeves, have those courageous conversations, and uh, and make the change that's needed. Uh, we 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 have to. There's no there's no doubt about it. So. Um, we'll continue to have those conversations. As you can see at HCCI, lots of people are involved in these conversations. We learn from each other. Uh, we, 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 we build on the work that people have done and, uh, and, and we try and move, move forward. So uh, basically that's our, that's our AGM. Well, I guess we are finishing a little bit early. That's good because uh, we also don't want you to spend so much time on your screen. That's also become a thing during this uh, during this pandemic. So uh, it's good it's good that we are ending a little bit early so that you can spend time uh, with uh, with 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 your family and friends. And for those of you that also want to support the work that's going on uh, in front of City Hall, you can also tune in as well. Um, more you can find more information. Uh, uh, by going to uh, defundhps.com. Uh, uh, and those, those courageous conversations uh, will, will be going on. So I will leave, I'll leave the last word to any of our board members that might want to, that might want to say something. Crystal? Crystal, is Crystal saying? No, Crystal is good. Okay, so Crystal is okay. Councillor Maureen Wilson, last words. No? I just wanted to thank everyone again and again. Educate, organize, agitate, and vote. <laughs> yes, very, very, very uh, succinct. Uh, Amy? Last word, okay, Cameron. 
Yeah, sure. Just want to say thank you for so much for all of this, for all the education, for having Nick on, for talking about ranked balloting. I'm just so inspired and hopeful to see what the next 20 years of this organization are going to do to keep dragging this city forward. Okay, thanks, Cameron. And Michelle. Okay, Michelle is waving. And uh, uh, in the back, in the background, we have uh, we have Tina. Tina has been in the in the background the whole the whole time, but uh, definitely there. And um, <laughs> and uh, a big thanks to all our other board members. There were a number of them that uh, were were watching. There were a number that couldn't make it. So I really like to say a big thank you to uh, all our board members uh, for. Uh, putting in the work, trusting, trusting all of us uh, to to get our, our our work done. So yes, we look forward to next year. Uh, next year, or I guess uh, 2020, 2020, 2021, uh, there are a number of difficult challenges that we have to face. And so uh, we hope we'll, we'll, we'll work through them. And again, for those of you, if you want to uh, support our work you can donate to us we need we need we need we need yeah we need we, we need money to work so you can you can donate you can do one-time donations you can also become a monthly donor um, so th those are options and then uh, you know amplify some of the some of the work that's happening across across the city so everyone everyone has said their last word and thank you all for tuning in and uh, we'll, we'll see you uh, next year or sometime uh, around the city when uh, public health uh, allows. So stay, stay safe um, and good night.